Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, everybody. Scott Luton and Kelly Barner here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to this episode of Dial P for Procurement. Kelly, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Scott. How are you? Doing wonderful. I love these episodes. Of course, our Supply Chain Now team does it in yes. conjunction with Kelly and our friends over at Buyer's Meeting Point. And today, Kelly, we're talking about government procurement, uh, procurement a rather unique practice, right? It's very unique. And it's one of those areas that although I have worked in companies that had divisions to serve the public sector, I know kind of enough. Um, but it's never an area that I've gotten to work in directly. And it's very unique. So even among the general procurement community, there isn't necessarily a ton of understanding. And that's partially because it's not one thing, right? It's different depending on the level you at. Are you city level, state level, federal? As administrations change, rules and guidelines and priorities change. So it's it's a constantly evolving thing, um, but also it provides some excellent ways to give back. So a very important and an impactful area of procurement. All right, you're gonna have to hold my hand. You've already blown my mind with all those complexities. <laughs> but uh, in addition to Kelly, uh, who's a, a true guru, we've got two dear friends we're gonna introduce in a minute. Uh, and so stand by for what's gonna be a, a wonderful and intriguing conversation. A quick programming note before we get started. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. And also we're gonna give you a few other, uh, uh, other resources. Uh, one of our guests has a wonderful vodcast that we would highly recommend too. Okay, so Kelly... I'm ready to get started. I'm chomping up a bit. I as well. All right. So let's welcome in our dear friends and featured guests. First up, Jacinta Talia, uh, Talia Uli. My apologies. Jacinta Talia Uli, who serves as Senior Procurement Advisor at the Ministry for Pacific Peoples. Jacinta, how are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. And their pronunciation was great as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, we, we practice hard and really Jacinta really thoroughly enjoyed our, our pre-show warm-up time. Looking forward to your uh, POV here today. Now, who connected us with Jacinta is our dear friend of the show, Kim Winter, founder and global CEO of the Logistics Executive Group. Kim, how you doing? Hey, Scott. I'm really good. And uh, thanks for uh, uh, asking me to join tonight. And hi to Kelly and hi to Jacinta. Wonderful. We've got, uh, unlike some past episodes where you may have seen Kelly and I, along with Kim, kind of serve as co-hosts today, we're featuring Jacinta as a, as a star guest along with Kim Winter. So, so buckle up and get ready as we dive in. So Kelly, we're going to start with our friends, Kim and Jacinta, kind of with our, our lightning round, right? Yes. And we've got some very good stories. So this is going to be a particularly interesting lightning round. Agreed. And, and you know, we touched on some of this in the pre-show. So we're looking forward to diving a little bit deeper. So Jacinta, starting, starting with you here. So Born in New Zealand, but your parents are from the Kingdom of Tonga, right? Uh, so tell us a little bit about how that unique culture and special culture has played a role in your journey. Yeah, sure. Um, so the Kingdom of Tonga is a small island nation in the Pacific Ocean with a population of around 100,000 people. Um, both my parents were born there and then they moved to New Zealand in their teens, um, where I was born and raised. Um, and also with their similar cultural values as well. Mm -hmm. So I now live in Auckland, New Zealand, which is home to the largest Polynesian population in the world. Um, and I would say that my journey between the two places has been less of a physical journey and more of a mental journey, mm -hmm. um, finding a way to bridge the two cultures together, especially in my professional life has been a journey for me and one that I am still on. So um, when I first entered my first corporate role, um, I had realized that I had to adapt some of my cultural pra practices, uh, in particular, how I communicated with people. A few examples of these was um, through communication. So in Tongan culture, respect is one of our core values. And one of the ways we show this is by not speaking back to people, especially if they're of higher authority to you or if they're older than you even. Hmm. Um, another one is criticism. Um, as direct or negative comments are usually avoided. Um, 
And one of the practices that I had to adapt to that kind of surprised me was eye contact, um, as sometimes eye contact can be seen as being too direct or maybe a little intimidating to some people. So um, in Tongan culture, we do tend to avoid it sometimes, um, especially if we're in the presence of someone who is of higher status. Mm -hmm. So the traditional way, I guess, is it's expected that you lower your gaze um, to indicate respect to that person. Um, so th those are just some of the, the communication or the cultural practices that I had to adapt to, although small, um, I had to adapt to because working in business becomes very challenging when you struggle to make eye contact with people or have um, trouble taking criticism even um, and out of respect, um, find it hard to challenge people and ask questions. So there was a lot of learning, unlearning and adapting that I had to do to get in a place where I felt comfortable speaking up and voicing my opinion in meetings and where I felt comfortable, you know, looking suppliers in the eye when negotiating with them and where I felt comfortable to, you know, take criticism as well. Jacinta, yeah. I, you know, I really appreciate you sharing that uh, because that, all, of, all of that was really my blind spot. So, so I'm going to come out of this knowing a lot more, but I know you said it was kind of a small adjustment, but those are, those are big, you know, uh, as we were talking kind of appreciate about some of the, our norms, how we were growing up when you've got to adjust so that you can be more um, effective in your role. I mean, those, those are some, yeah. some big adjustments. So I, I appreciate you sharing those with us. And, and uh, we want to, um, if I can, apart from your cultural journey, I've just got to ask you uh, now that we're, we started the show, you shared one thing that you're, passionate about where you spend some of your free time would you indulge us here yeah so I do have an interest in kickboxing it helps me uh, take my mind off work afterwards and um, just just to relax and you know step away from that work environment afterwards so that's something I enjoy doing after work <laughs> I love that I love yeah. that so don't mess with Jacinta uh, <laughs> no. suppliers all right. <laughs> all right so Kim switching over to you let's talk about your journey uh, so tell us about where it began and, and of course, where you are today. It's, it's a story in of itself. Sure, Scott. Well, it's a, it's a long, long time ago that my journey started, but I'm also a Kiwi. So uh, Jacinda and I are distant cousins of some sort within our, in our small country of 4 million people or so. So I was born in the 50s. I'm a baby boomer. Um, and I was born in Wellington. Jacinda's in Auckland, which is the biggest city. Um, but Wellington is the bureaucratic and cap political capital, and it's a very university town. So I was brought up in, uh, in, a, in a really good environment in New Zealand. We all play sport um, uh, to, a, to an addiction level. Um, many people will know we've got the most famous rugby team in the world, the All Blacks, which has uh, within its group some, always some famous Tongans uh, and Samoans and uh, Māori. Uh, members uh, more so because of the uh, the strength of character and the strength of uh, physique of our Polynesian cousins. So uh, it's an exciting sport to play. Um, so I was Wellington, uh, educated there, uh, sort of did a degree there, always worked from a very early age, working class family. Um, Mum and dad gave us a great upbringing, myself and my brother. We got involved in natural history. We have a, a fantastic country, awesome natural beauty, volcanic areas, lakes, mountains, you name it. There's everything, beaches, whales, sharks, <laughs> creepy things. <laughs> and uh, I got brought up there and, uh, and, I, and I ended up in Australia. So uh, I, I graduated uh, uh, with an MBA and then ended up over in Australia and set up logistics executive group, which I'm the global CEO of, and we've been going for 22 years now. And uh, we co-host co and collaborate very closely with Supply Chain Now all the way over there in Atlanta. Well, and we uh, are very uh, appreciative of that relationship. And, and I'll tell you, Kelly, you can probably attest to, you know, there are folks that you meet in your journey that are ultimate bridge builders, right? Uh, Absolutely. From a cultural standpoint, from a business standpoint, from a sense of community standpoint, and and uh, Jacinta, we've only known each other for a little while, but I've known Kim and Kelly, for that matter, for a while. And both of y'all are wonderful bridge builders. So I, I really admire that about you both. Um, Kim, one additional, I want to follow up one before I toss it over to Kelly here. How, how, are you, how have you balanced that Tongan culture and, and, and that New Zealand upbringing with the demands of the business world? 
Yeah, well, quite frankly, the multicultural nature of New Zealand, uh, and I'm sure that, you know, there are challenges from time to time, um, around, especially with our, our distant history of when colonialisation occurred in New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand is one of the only countries where the Indigenous population was never completely subjugated by the European, in this case, the English uh, conquerors, if you like. They never conquered New Zealand. The Polynesians were very strong. Uh, and very, very capable uh, warriors. Uh, all of the nations, uh, uh, Tongans, Samoans, the Cook Islanders, uh, around Southern, South Pacific, very strong navigators, very sophisticated cultures and tribal cultures. And uh, so that, that's just part of who we are. That's our, that we're Tangata Whenua, people of the land. And, and Jacinta can perhaps talk more to this uh, herself from her experience. But I've always been uh, very, very pleased to be brought up in the multicultural, team-based and sporting sort of environment where everybody's treated equal. We're very egalitarian. We don't have the big class system in New Zealand. So we all uh, eat off the same plate and fight off the same pitch. Um, to me... I've never even thought about, frankly, that question, Scott. It's a really in incisive question. Uh, there is no balancing for me about any culture with our business in New Zealand. And even though I've been out of New Zealand, I'm a resident of, of several countries. Uh, to me, it's just part of the deal. It's what we do. We are a multicultural society. It has no impact on me and it never has in terms of business. I love it. And, of course, I don't think you mentioned that, that now – uh, you called to buy home, which was a big part of our last episode, which was yeah. fascinating. I think Kelly and I both learned a ton about just, you know, the biggest thing that stood out was the innovative spirit of that market and, and the, the, uh, how they're acting on it's, it's not, we're not talking about new ideas. We're talking about new, new things they are putting into the market and, and acting on, on, on new ways of, of doing things and solving problems. So love that. We might touch on that a little later on, but Kelly, so great, great question. I got a Kelly. Kelly question for that, uh, or credit for that question, <laughs> Kelly. Uh, so where are we going next, Kelly? So from cultural journey to professional journey, um, Scott, you've probably noticed by now that for every new procurement guest we bring on, there's always this one question we want to know the answer to because everybody has a different story. So Jacinta, I happen to know in advance that you have a great story. How did you end up finding a career in procurement? Yeah, so I studied operations management and supply chain at the University of Auckland, and although there was some mention of procurement during my studies, I still didn't know a lot about it. I knew it was um, this, this, this aspect of supply chain. Um, so during my last year of university, I saw an opportunity come up where a group called Tuputola was looking for a Pacific person who studied supply chain for an internship. Um, I kind of sat down in my classroom thinking about this and I looked around and I was like, oh, wait, hold on, that's me. Um, <laughs> I'm a specific person who studies supply chain um, because there weren't that many students um, yeah. who majored in supply chain and also really any Pacific Islanders who even studied supply chain. So I started my career as a procurement intern at an airline and really enjoyed the profession of procurement. Um, but before that, I hadn't really thought about um, where you got the food that you're served on an airplane um, had come from or how the cabin interior um, gets inside a plane. So that was all new to me and I found it really interesting. And four years later, um, I'm still in the profession of procurement. And yet in a way, we sort of met you before we met you because Kim shared this excellent speech that you gave, a video of the speech with us. And one of the highlights of that speech is the moment where you define procurement or you explain how you define procurement to others in your life. Um, can you share that with us now? Yeah, sure. So I actually had <laughs> no idea how to explain procurement to my friends or family. They would ask me uh, what I did for work. And I would say I work in procurement after seeing them with puzzled faces. I'd try again <laughs> and try other different answers like sourcing, but they'd still look confused. And then I'd say, oh, I'm a professional shopper. And they're like, what, what does that mean? Um, so I decided to settle on, I buy cool stuff because sometimes I do actually really enjoy buying stuff, um, especially in the public sector yeah. roles, buy public roading, um, state housing, um, lots of awesome IT goods and services and stuff. So that's what I decided to settle on. I buy cool stuff and that's how I explain procurement now. Which everybody um, wants to do, right? That, that's like recruiting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's been my definition now. Um, yeah, and a simple way of explaining it as well. 
And that video that we got to see, so that was a speech that you gave at a Tupatoa gala dinner, um, which you know is the internship program that helped you find procurement, but it's an organization that you have stayed involved with. Can you tell us just a little bit generally about the internship program and the role that you serve there and, and why doing that kind of work is important to you? Yeah, sure. So Tupatoa is an organization that provides employment opportunities for um, Māori and Pacific students. Um, their vision is to grow Māori and Pacific leaders for a greater Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, so just disclaimer, I don't work for them, but I do. Um, I, I took part in their internship program, which provided me with my first step into the corporate world, um, something that I probably would have had trouble with had I tried myself, because there are barriers which are biased against um, Māori and Pacific communities, um, unfortunately. Um, so this is why programs like Tupatoa mm. are really important. There is no company yet listed on the New Zealand Stock Exchange even that has a Māori or Pacific CEO, and only... 17 percent of New Zealand's top 60 firms have an executive who identifies as other than European so I think it's really important that we address these inequalities so that we can fill these knowledge gaps and reap the benefits of diversity and support business growth so um, it's also been really important as me as well um, so that we can address these areas of um, and barriers as well um, and areas of inequality there are for Māori and Pacific people to enter the corporate world and hopefully make it easier for, you know, the next generation. Absolutely. And even the fact that that's being tracked now, right? Obviously, you would like to see more diversity or local ownership, leadership at the, at the C-suite level. But the fact that there's an awareness and then there are organizations like Tupatoa that are working to yeah. change things. It, you, the work may not be done, right? Um, but you're definitely moving things in the right direction. So it's an important organization, clearly, to be a part of. Mm. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Now, Kim, I'm not imagining that you have a story that is necessarily going to compete. Um, <laughs> procurement's a little bit wackier from a corporate perspective than supply chain is. Um, but how did you end up specializing in supply chain logistics? Thanks, Kelly. I'd just like to say that I love procurement people because they control so much and they control the cash. So uh, in my <laughs> business, a global consulting firm, a global consulting firm and uh, in logistics and supply chain, uh, we, we love procurement people. You say you're not marketing. They control the cash. That's a good alternative, <laughs> Jacinta. Somebody asked you, I control the cash. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a nice way. <laughs> but in, but in, in answer to your quick question, to a question, just quickly, I mean, I, I just rolled into it. I mean, I was doing an uh, undergraduate degree in Wellington in the 70s. Um, I've been playing uh, professional rugby in the US uh, prior to that. And um, I uh, came back and thought I'd, you know, get a bit serious and, uh, and did a degree. And, um, and while I was doing that, I was driving trucks. And then the guy who was driving the truck left, left the truck, left the business, and I took it over. And, uh, and then the company went contract. And then so I had a contract at, at a very early age and I was driving the truck at 17. The illegal age was 18. So I drove for <laughs> half a year illegally. <laughs> uh, it, was all, it was all good. And then all of a sudden, I have about five, 10 years, I had about eight, nine trucks and uh, had my own trucking company. And um, from there, ended up getting uh, recruited, uh, sold that business. And I got it recruited by uh, an airline owned by TNT, which is now SEVA probably owned by somebody else now, um, but yeah, owned in an airline. So I was general manager at a very early age for Central New Zealand for ANSET Airlines, yeah, ANSET Air Freight. I uh, got picked up by a merchant bank to set up a telco in Australia. And then uh, from, the, from 1999, I set up my own business, Logistics Executive Group Consulting and Logistics Supply Chain, Headhunting, Mergers, Acquisitions, Transformations. That was the journey. It's been a quick 66 years. <laughs> well, and I stand corrected because the typical procurement career journey is a little bit swirly. It's a little different than HR, finance, marketing, but I will give you honorary procurement career journey status because illegally driving a truck too young while playing professional rugby, that counts. <laughs> <laughs> we've, recruited a lot of, we've recruited a lot of procurement people, so I understand the craft yeah. and the whole uh, being of procurement very, very well. We've recruited them all over the world. Yeah. Well, and to the idea of collecting people, um, somewhat connected to what we've been talking about, you have a, a large 
following. You have a large personal network. You have a large following on social media. Um, from my conversations with you, my read is that it comes to you naturally, any influencer or connector status that you might have. Although many people now are sort of deliberately trying to set out and make that their, their primary focus to build up that influencer status. It seems like yours has come across naturally. Um, any thoughts about this sort of rise in the notion of the influencer um, and any advice that you might have for people that are looking to build up their networks? Absolutely, absolutely. So just quickly, um, to us, uh, sharing information has been absolutely key in 22 years in the community of the ecosystem of supply chain logistics. We made an effort right from the word go to go to events. It wasn't so much online in those days, of course, uh, internet, LinkedIn, what have you, wasn't it anywhere near as preeminent. Um, so we went to conferences and ended up being speaking at conferences, then ended up for the last 15 years I've been emceeing conferences uh, all over the world. We've been promoting them on our various channels. And the biggest learning I had over the last two or three years has been supply chain now. And that's uh, <laughs> where I work a lot. And I started to see Scott and, uh, and Greg White uh, on the waves of being the CNN in Atlanta of supply chain and logistics. And I learned my craft and my trade of doing interviews, which we do, and some we join with you guys. But um, And we've just kept on sharing information, kept on sharing the love, kept on telling stories and talking to people like Jacinta, talking to people who are interesting, got a journey, got a, got a garden path that they're walking down uh, to share with people across the supply chain to, as much as anything, to encourage more people to get involved and understand supply chain the way it is. Yeah. So Kelly, I, I got to interject. I know we're, we're going a different direction here, but um, so Kim, there's a, there's a, a commercial and Kelly, you might remember too, in the, in the eighties that I grew up on, it was pretty famous where it, it, and I can't remember which firm it was. It was an investment firm. And there was a guy that would, would have this catchphrase of, of we make money the old fashioned way we earn it. And yeah. when I heard Kelly ask that question about, you know, how you've accumulated that, that, that yeah. wherewithal and that, um, you know, the network and, and just, uh, um, you know, the, your influence, your answer is spot on. You, you have earned it and it comes from a very genuine spot. And, and that's what I've loved about, I believe folks do it the right way versus to Kelly's point about folks that, that jump out because they want to be the, the, you know, the, 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 the flavor of the month, this influencer thing, yeah. you know, it comes from being a resource and being an educator and being a connector and, and oh. being having been there and done that. So I, I admire that and, and um, appreciate everybody's kindred spirits here in that regard. But Kelly, uh, is it time to shift gears and talk more? It is a little okay. more about procurement supply chain culture. Okay, wonderful. I want to make sure I was on cue there. Sometimes I can I can get ahead of myself. But um, and there's and by the way, there's a lot more to Jacinta's and Kim's personal journeys. We'll have to uh, bring that out in, in, in a follow up episode. But Kim, I want to stick with you. And we think about supply chain and procurement or, or with the latter folks that have the cash, as you put it, another t-shirtism, <laughs> what things there seem really universal and what things there seem very localized um, uh, in, in those spaces? Well, you know what, Scott, to, to us uh, having, I don't know what it is, 13 offices around the world, being in business for 22 years uh, and being essentially a consultative type of company, which also has the, the talent management the executive search in it. Um, what, we, we see everything through the lens and the scope of being universal. Now, now, sure, there are localised scenarios and localised cultures and languages and mores and res respect and various things that sort of Jacinda was talking about before. And uh, again, uh, Polynesian culture is, is enormously rich in some of the better uh, types of values that you would ever want a culture to have, quite frankly, and the more that Polynesian spirit and culture could be circulated around the world, the better. To the point, um, of you know what things seem universal and what things seem localized, the world has become enormously shrunk. Somebody shrunk the world, and as much as we hear about divisiveness and we've had political rise ups in the right wing around the world of all of these different countries, my personal belief is that's going to be an aberration. I believe that people will see the common sense. We're seeing that in certain countries, some big ones that we know of, where we're seeing a reversal back to collaboration, back to cooperation, back to 
the need for universality instead of divisiveness. And supply chain, I see, as a platform, if you like, an analogy for the value and the necessity for collaboration and for universality. Uh, supply chain in itself, logistics in itself, procurement activity is all about the sum of the parts and dealing with different people in different elements of businesses, countries, governments, to be able to get the best result, not only for the shareholders, the community, the ecosystem, and uh, the employees themselves and companies. So uh, my view is supply chain is the epitome of universality. I love it. I think it is, uh, to your point, I think global supply chain is a, um, you know, it's a universal solvent, you know, what are, what are claims that title, but I think it's supply chain, you know, you cut through differences, you cut through different, you know, where you are, you cut through even roles, uh, you know, just since we talked about kind of, you know, the, the various tiers of leadership, it really creates this, 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 um, global community around getting stuff done, right? No, as we've said a thousand times, no product, no program that, that is, that can be applied to any supply chain organization. So Kim, I, I agree with you in, in, in a lot of what you shared there. Um, let's, I want to take it a step further though, because just like Jacinta was kind enough to walk us through some of her um, um, key considerations she had to make from a cultural standpoint. So that, so that it was, it was for the greater good and for her, you know, for her to be able to, to act uh, effectively in her role. What do you see, Kim, when we when we are reflecting on our own parts of our own culture, things that we may need to adjust similarly for you know various other people around the world? Sure. Any, anything come to mind? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And and I've had an opportunity to, whilst you're talking that, it, things are clicking in my mind. But before I do that, I just want to say the reason that I was so taken, Jacinta, by your speech was not only the manifest uh authenticity with which and I was just sitting on LinkedIn and I'm scrolling through and it's a thousand clicks here and there and all of a sudden I see this Polynesian woman speaking with authenticity genuineness you're obviously a little bit nervous at the beginning you had a big crowd there but your story got rolling and within the speech of I don't know about three or four minutes you made me laugh you made me cry you made me feel proud to be a New Zealander you, you made me incredibly proud of the fact that a young woman coming from a culture that is, I know, in Poly Polynesian culture, especially Tongan culture, very traditional, that you were so forceful and respectful in what you said. And I'm going to recommend, and I'm going to make sure we get the link on here for people to go and see that speech. Because I've seen TikTok speeches, and I've seen uh, TikTok <laughs> speeches all over the world. And it's one of the best speeches I'll ever see. So I'm really with you. Oh, thanks, Kim. Well, hey, <laughs> it, a little known, fa little known fact, <laughs> by the way, and Kim, I love that you, you shared that uh, heartfelt feedback, is we had to go through Jacinta's agent to get her booked for this episode <laughs> because uh, she's in the Hollywood sphere <laughs> now. But, 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 but to but the Kim, point, I will, yeah. I will answer your point. I know I went down a rabbit hole there, but it was a worthy one, right? It's a good one. Uh, so, but look, quite simply, in 30 seconds or less, um, you know, how do we, how do I reflect on culture that, that may help me deal with other cultures? I'm sorry, I'm almost the wrong guy to talk to because um, I'm, all, I'm totally agnostic in terms of culture. I'm a New Zealand citizen. I'm, I'm a legal resident of Hong Kong, uh, Australia, and Dubai, where I am tonight. Up until COVID, I traveled 50 to 60 international flights a year. Um, and I just am always have, and many, many New Zealanders, and you know, we're not a perfect society, but we're a damn sight more perfect than many. And we talk <laughs> and communicate, and we don't get out there and have wars and fight. Um, and a big part of uh, Polynesian culture, Maori culture, is to sit down and speak genuinely with respect to each other and solve our problems that way. Um, so to me, it's very much, I, I just, every culture we see, we embrace, uh, I talked to you at the top of the show, we had a function going at my place here tonight, a little bit earlier, we had seven different cultures. Um, the meals were blessed in four different sorts of religious texts. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just, to me, to me, supply chain compresses all that. If you've got the right attitude, the platform is there in supply chain and procurement is a very key element 
of that supply chain as we know, whereby it's irrelevant. I don't care what culture people or, or race they're from or, or, or what gender they are. It doesn't matter. It's we, we've got a job to do. We, if we respect each other for who we are, what we are and where we come from, we can all go to a place which is going to be a much, much better place for society. All right. Uh, y- y'all see that wall behind me. I'm ready to run through it now that Kim, Kim, <laughs> Kim has got me. Got That, that was very well said and very genuine, which is a big part of, of, of everyone here at this conversation. I love it. Um, okay. So one, I do want to make one last uh, note on this conversation because I think, you know, awareness, it's awareness, you know, what we all do or what we all say or, or, or how we approach business. It may be very normal and it may be, you know, we were talking about some, some normal things related to our upbringing pre-show. I think it's just being aware and being willing to be aware of how others may perceive it. And, and, and just like Jacinta was so, um, uh, consider it in terms of her making her adjustments. I think we all have to be willing to, to um, you know, take steps like that. So I admire that. And, and thanks for, for answering my question, Kim. Okay. So Kelly, I'm not, I'll tell you so far, I'm going to have to go get some popcorn in a minute. Where are we going next? <laughs> We're actually going maybe from awareness to context. Um, so just into one of the things that we've gotten to know about you. And I think the phrase that you have used a few times in our conversations is the tongue and way. So you talk about the fact that you were born and raised in New Zealand, but your parents brought you up in the traditional tongue and way. And it's something that you have purposefully set out to learn more about as an adult. So we've talked a little bit about tongue and values, um, but what has your journey as an adult been like to deliberately explore maybe the root of some of those values and the root of that way of living and how you've consciously chosen? I mean, you've talked about the eye contact, you've talked about some of the cultural things, uh, but what made you go off in search to understand more about that? Yeah, so um, definitely it's been quite interesting now working in a role where I do work for an organization that serves specific people. Um, I've had to relearn some of those practices to make sure that I'm still showing respect and humility when I'm working with Pacific people. Um, So like I mentioned before, I'm still on that journey um, to finding a way to bridge those two cultures together. But I think it's just important to know that and and we've touched on you know some of these key driving um, key driving values for especially Polynesian cultures like respect and humility and um, collaboration as well. Um, but it, it's just good to know that there are different cultural practices when you deal with different groups of people. So I would say if you find yourself doing business in this situation, I think you're more likely to get a better outcome if you learn and understand the different ways that different cultures communicate and um, how they interact with each other or even some of the values that drive the culture as well. Um, So a lot of my journey about learning the Tong culture as an adult has been going back to those values, going back to those roots. um, And it's just been interesting. Yeah, like I keep saying, like trying to bridge, you know, the Western values and then my cultural values together. But it's definitely been an interesting journey so far. And, and part of it's the language, right? Because even in this brief conversation, we've talked about certainly the Asia Pacific region or Asia PAC, if we're, if we're abbreviating things. We've talked about New Zealand, we've talked about Australia, we've talked about Polynesian cultures, but then you work at an organization specifically focused on Polynesian peoples. So yeah. there's all of these different groups and granularities. Um, clearly the further down you get, the more complex it is. Um, Can you help give us a little bit of context? So obviously we know Asia Pac is a region, New Zealand is a country, we're hopefully good there. Um, But when you start looking into, you know, what's the difference between New Zealanders, Pacific peoples, Polynesian cultures, how complex is that landscape? Yeah, it's quite complex because um, there are a lot of different, each culture has its own different values. Um, And I think that 
Polynesian culture, um, just as a contrast, is definitely more laid back than the rest of Asia Pacific, where some countries in the region um, operate in a much more fast paced and agile environment. Um, I think Kim touched on it before, there's way more uh, emphasis and way more value in those face to face interactions rather than doing business over email. Um, so definitely from a Polynesian perspective, um, that's how you would communicate if you're dealing with Polynesian suppliers in the region. Um, uh, those face-to-face -face interactions would provide you with more value rather than um, doing things over email. But those are just some of the differences. But I think that at the end of the day, there are some similarities across the Asia Pacific regions in terms of the respect that we do have for our individual cultural values. And I think that's a similarity that's shared across the region, yeah. And those are all particularly important being in public sector procurement because you're not necessarily dealing with a, with a customer, you are dealing with a community with a culture. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit specifically about public sector procurement. Um, what is it that you enjoy the most you know, you talked about some of the different categories of things that you get to spend the cash on, Kim, um, that people working in corporate procurement might not be. Um, but what is the part of it that you particularly enjoy? Yeah, so most of my career so far has been working for the public sector in procurement. Um, so these views on on my own. I, I'm not speaking on behalf of any organization or anything, but I've enjoyed procuring a different range of goods and services from public housing to public voting, like I mentioned earlier, to social and IT services. Um, so I think working in the public sector for me and what's driven me to um, work in this area, it's been a rewarding way for me to give back um, and also influence how these goods and services are procured for, um, you know, for the public and making sure that they provide value to people and making sure that they are delivered on time and in a respectful way as well. Um, I think that's really important, but working in the public sector has definitely been um, a way for me to give back. Yes. Have you had an opportunity to sort of be a, a user of any of your own work? You know, you talk about oh. road work projects. Have you gotten to interact as a member of the community with any of the things that you've been involved in from a procurement perspective? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I would, I would say definitely at an early age, you know, surrounded by state housing, um, public roading. I went to a state high school. Um, so I think having seen how those, and, and I was a big user of public services as well, public libraries, I love public mm -hmm. libraries, public gardens, um, all those kind of things. Um, I was a huge user of it when I was um, a child. So I think to be able to be in a position now where I can be a part of that process and where I can influence how those things have been delivered is, um, is why I'm in this profession of procurement now. Um, and it's been, really interesting as well just to make sure that when we're part of this we make sure that we communicate with the community um, and get their ideas and get their input as well on how we can deliver better services for everyone. Which is so incredibly important right Scott and, and in terms of helping everyone be successful whether it's the community that you're procuring things for or the individuals that you're working with um, where are we taking the conversation from here? Yes, uh, excellent. Uh, and by the way, if y'all hear dogs barking, it is uh, Ruby and Dex over here that don't like <laughs> whatever <laughs> is being delivered. So, <laughs> um, all right, that's right. Yeah. Talking of helping people, I, one of our favorite topics here for sure. From a career standpoint, you know, helping people find those positions where they're going to be uh, successful and they can they can. Uh, actively contribute and 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 be fulfilled, right? Um, so, Kim, I'd love for you to weigh in on that. I mean, you and your team are, amongst other things, y'all do. You're certainly certainly uh, masters at doing that. Speak. To, how, how does that? How do you how do you approach that? How, how do you make that happen? Well, it's it's really uh, again basic basic economics, Scott. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's uh, it's all about supply and demand. And you know, as long as I've uh, been in business, which is started a paper run at the age of seven. 
Um, I've always loved the ability to be able to spend money and I soon realised you actually have to earn money to spend it so that didn't take too long to work out and <laughs> and so uh, for me uh, it's all about service if you it doesn't matter what you're doing who you work for who you work with who you're serving unless you have a service mindset I believe you're going to struggle um, it, it's it's really that that way unless you believe in community Unless you think of your fellow man and woman, um, then you, you you don't get it. Then you're not going to be successful at anything you do, business or socially or any other other thing. And I just might say here that we were talking about cultural uh, issues earlier on, of course, and then the Polynesian um, cultural landscape. I must say right here, right now, I want to put a shout out unashamedly. My house, one of my housemates at University, Victoria University in Wellington, my undergrad degree in the early years was uh, a lovely 19 year old uh, Samoan woman. And her name is Fia Mea Naomi Mata'afa. Uh, and she was the king's daughter at that point. And he was the prime minister. And yesterday, she, uh, I think, and uh, Jacinta, you may be able to help me here. And uh, I posted this on LinkedIn. I'm very proud to see that the political coup that is taking place in the kingdom of uh, Samoa currently, I uh, think, has been usurped and the rightful elective representative of the people is Fia Mea, which is a royal title, Naomi uh, Mata'afa. Correct, Jacinda? Yeah, sounds correct. <laughs> yeah, so there's been a, uh, been a battle. It's been a bit disconcerting amongst the Polynesian nations, not the least of which is New Zealand. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so, but I, I, I housemated with her for a year and an undergrad degree. I learned so much about service from her because she's always been servicing her people, serving her people. And I learned about the cultural differences there. As I've carried that forward. Uh, I've seen that irrespective of what you're doing, where you're doing it in terms of finding, putting people in roles. It's if you're good at what you do and you're skilled and you're experienced and you're authentic, then clients, and we've got probably four or 500 clients currently globally, tier one and tier two clients around the world, private and public sector, that will come to you uh, if you're genuine and open, if they know that, especially if you've got probably the world's biggest database outside of the US of supply chain and logistics personnel over 22 years. And so it's really just supply chain, uh, supply and demand, Scott. It's, it's not difficult for, if you're passionate about what you do. Yes, I, I appreciate that. And you've kind of, you've already kind of spoken to my follow-up question um, earlier in your comments and then a little bit in your answer there, but I'm going to give you an opportunity that in case we missed anything, you know, when you, when you, when you're talking about recruiting and, and placement across cultures, across geographic regions, across you know various teams y'all have here, there and everywhere, uh, different needs, different sectors. Um, you know, how do you, how do you compensate for all that, um, all that variance? Sure. Well, well, it's a great question, and it's 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 reality is that every nation, every culture, every country has massive, massive differences about them. And unless you're somebody who really gets it, that it takes the time to work hard, to understand, to learn the language. Um, for me, basic on about a dozen different languages. Basically, every country that we deal with, or every region. Um, then you're not going to get, unless you show that respect, that basic core values that comes back, round back to what Jacinta was talking about, respect, all of those core values that are very, very strong in the Polynesian culture. Um, I've carried with me since very, being very young, and I've found as a natural, uh, natural thing, if you like, that just understanding cultures, people get it. If you show respect, I mean, I, I MC conferences again now face-to-face -face, two last week and uh, I've done several hundred conferences. I greet in seven or eight languages every conference. I find out what cultures are there. I show respect. People understand that it's not just off the top. It's not just a nuance. It's not just cliche as you right. often use the word. Um, and it's, it's being around that culture and understanding what's important. You know, Thailand, Indonesia, we're recruiting at the moment. Um, it, Taiwan, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Asian, Asian countries are extremely challenging. And uh, if you don't understand the respect issues there, you've got no chance of doing business, <laughs> right? There's just no way. You, you can make a slip up in one second that's going to screw you for a year. Well, 
Thank you very much. And and I can attest and Kelly and I can both attest to what Kim's sharing because it spills over into the emails and the touches between the touches and kind of prep for conversations like this. It, it really, you go the extra mile to really share that understanding. And I, I really appreciate that. I need to, I need to do a lot more of that. Um, but Kelly, I want to, I want to turn the table. I know you're going to take it in a different direction in a second, but a big part of what Kim just shared there was about respect was about respect. It's another one of those universal solvents for sure. And we were just talking earlier today about a little lack of respect amongst some conversations that, that, that we weren't privy to, but other folks were having. And when it comes to doing business with folks and it comes to procurement conversations, procurement supply, you know, all that stuff, mm-hmm. respect goes a long way, almost regardless of what culture is across the globe. Speak to that for a second, if you would, Kelly. Well, you know, and it's interesting because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of reflecting back, you know, you sort of have a sense of how far are we through the conversation? What are we hoping to draw out? And I think maybe one of the things that I didn't truly think about until this moment is that as much as it's important to focus on culture and community, whether you happen to be talking about Pacific peoples or procurement versus supply chain, at the end of the day, that respect and those human connections come down to an individual level. Right. And so, Kim, your ability to connect with different communities and people and companies and ways of working ultimately comes down to you being sort of a a gregarious, outgoing person that loves diversity and embraces that in others. Right. And Jacinta, you've taken procurement and made it your own. And you're an amazing representative of the kind of work that we can do both for communities and, and companies around the world. And I think to an extent, especially when you're talking about something as fundamental as risk and not risk, respect and mutual uh, consideration, it's an individual responsibility that each one yeah. of us has, you know, to be aware of the others around us um, because diversity has a lot more to do with nationality and skin color and culture and language, it really comes down to how each of us sees the world and, and how we choose to interact with it. Absolutely, absolutely. Said. And, and, and just, just to, to cut in there, uh, Kelly, in, in regard to that, you talk, you talk about the importance of uh, understanding and the value of you know, issues through the supply chain. Mm-hmm. For me, in, in the side of the business when I'm running it on the recruitment side, uh, it's even more significant and important than that because I'm carrying the hopes and aspirations and dreams and desires of people in my hands um, as to whether I'm able to position them in the right role for them and their families so that they can move forward and have the life that they seek to have. Um, and, and if I fail to do that to the best of my ability and I fail to understand uh, the client needs, the, the cultural understandings in particular, um, or any aspects about that, whether it's a procurement person that I'm placing or an operations person, a BD, or whether it's uh, any form of uh, logistics or supply chain, if I don't get that right and I don't optimize my effort and my work for that person, uh, I can I can completely uh, change that person's life in the wrong way, as opposed to doing what we've done several thousand times in 22 years, and and hopefully changed it in the right way. Absolutely, no, absolutely. Um, and Jacinta, if we if we take what Kim has said and sort of bring this whole conversation down to an individual level for you, um, you know, the way that time zones work. This is, you know, a late afternoon for Scott and I. It's midnight post party, as he said, for, for Kim and his gathering. And you're actually just getting ready to start a new day. Um, and so you're going to come off this conversation and get ready and, and go to work. Um, what is your day to day like if we bring it down to that individual level? What is it that you're heading off to do today within your role in procurement for your community based on the work that you currently have going on? Yeah, definitely. So um, work today, I'm going to work after this, it will be straight onto the computer, checking emails and things. But a lot of it is identifying how we can make everyone's lives easier through procurement and I know that sounds super cliche um, or you know super 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 cheesy even but I think procurement has um, there's an opportunity there to identify how we can make 
the lives of the public easier through yeah. the way we interact with our internal stakeholders, but also how do we make sure that we're working with um, suppliers, any culture, how do we make sure that we're working with suppliers in a respectful way? Um, yeah. So that'll be kind of the mindset that I'm going into work today. How do we, how, how can we work with everyone in a respectful way today? And that is something we can all aspire to achieve. Yes. And it's only cheesy if you don't mean it. I, I think there's, there's right. authenticity in, in spades in this conversation. And, and, and uh, you know, Kim, to your point, we'll absolutely make sure we include the link to Jacinta's yes. uh, keynote and address in the show notes of this episode. Um, Cause it was, it was a very powerful and I, I love the range of, of emotions that Kim shared earlier and Jacinta, you gotta, we gotta keep a microphone in front of you. I mean, you're really an inspiring figure and I, and I really appreciate your, uh, you know, your, your uh, transparency with us here as part of your journey and, and Kim, the same for you. Um, all right. So the trillion dollar question, because due to inflation, <laughs> Um, let's make sure folks know how to connect with both of our dear guests and friends here today. And just since I want to start with you, how can folks connect and compare notes and who knows, maybe invite you to a keynote, one of their upcoming events. Yeah, sure. So feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, Jacinta Talia Oli. Yep. It's just that easy. We'll include that link in the show notes too. We're after one click. <laughs> yep. uh, love that Jacinta. And then Kim, you're, uh, gosh, you're everywhere. Folks can't find you. <laughs> then they're going to think other problems. But Kim, how can folks connect with you? Multi-platformed. Uh, yeah, so LinkedIn is, is the be-all and end-all and much uh, of uh, media these days. So Kim Winter, K-I-M, Winter, uh, on LinkedIn. Our website for logistics executive is the logisticsexecutive.com. Um, and uh, you can see, I'll probably put my email for people who want to contact me underneath as well. But uh yeah, I'm, I'm LinkedIn's the place. I'm also the uh, the chairman and founder of oasisafrica.org.au, oasisafrica.org.au, freedom from poverty for uh, through education, over 8,000 kids in the slums of East Africa. So you'll wow. find me on that website as well. well we, we're going to have to have you back and, and dive into that. That's one of the various projects and initiatives that you're a part of that I have not learned a lot more about. So we'll tee that up for our next conversation. But appreciate appreciate what you both do. Uh, really appreciate the the give back, the give forward, and and really how this conversation I think mm -hmm. is going to help folks uh, be more aware on a variety of levels. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Jacinta Talia Uli and Kim Winter. I really appreciate y'all here today. And Kelly, um, so many uh, you know, seventeen pages of notes. We always kind of kid about talk about <laughs> that's my cliche, yeah. but really this was. Um, I love how you you kind of put this this conversation together, you know, we're, we're, we're well known for how we prep for conversations and, and they're authentic conversations, but you know, you gotta, you gotta find the right angle and, 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 and the right creative. And really, I love how we've kind of blended this uh, as a mixture between the cultural journeys and the mm -hmm. professional journeys, because there's so many ways they intertwine Kelly. And, and maybe, maybe I'm spilling a secret here. Maybe that has a lot to do with my own philosophy. The procurement is ultimately the people business. No, we're not human resources, although we work with them a lot, right? But whether it's us as a team, the executive team, a community that we're serving through the public sector, suppliers, internal stakeholders, um, at the end of the day, we're ultimately helping people and working with people. And if you don't truly love the people that you're working with, and of course, show them respect, as we heard today, you are never going to save a dollar that's worth having. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. Uh, spoken like a, a true champion. Procurement is is for the people. Love that. Uh, and be sure to check out, of course, Buyer's Meeting Point and Art of Procurement. We'll include mm -hmm. those links as well. Great uh, communities that Kelly uh, leads and is part of. And Kim, we didn't mention your vodcast. Let's make sure folks know how to connect with that. Where, where can we find that? Yeah, Logistics Executive TV. So yeah, thanks for that. And uh, again, learn my craft off the master. So uh, we're really, uh, really pleased with the way it's going. And uh, But I really thought that uh, when I first came up with Jacinta, I thought she's too big for just us. We've got to get her onto supply chain now. So uh, hey, Jacinta, respect to you. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Really enjoyed uh, talking with you again. And uh, I can tell you right now, as a career professional globally, you are going to have an amazing career. Mm -hmm. hey, that, oh, that, thank you, Kim. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, Kelly, for having me. You bet. And I couldn't imagine a better way of closing the conversations on that note right there, because there's lots of consensus. Uh, but 
Kelly Barner, always a pleasure to have these Dial P for procurement conversations. Love that series right here at Supply Chain Now. Really appreciate our friends here, our old and new. I love the, the, what y'all do and all of your contributions. Stay tuned for a lot more of Kim Winter here at Supply Chain Now as well. And um, on that note, hey, folks, um, hope you have a great week wherever you are. Hopefully you find this conversation to be inspiring and uplifting and and you know, give you some learnings that maybe were in your blind spot, like, like so much was in mine. Um, you know, you can find more about supply chain now at supplychainnow.com or wherever you get your podcast from. And Hey, you gotta be more like Jacinta and Kim and Kelly. We challenge you to do good, give forward and be the change that's needed, whatever you do. And we'll see you next time right here at supply chain. Now. Thanks everybody. Thanks for being a part of our supply chain. Now community. Check out all of our programming at supplychainnow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now. Supply Chain Now.